Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here for the sixth meeting of the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group, which is a joint enterprise of the uh, New America and R Street Institute. Can you hear me over there, Phil? All right, I'm going to really, really strain myself to boom since they put us in the star chamber. Uh, so our, our plan today is the usual model. Uh, I'll speak for a short time and then our two speakers will each talk for about 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll open it up to the floor for discussion. As many of you know, the purpose of this group is to create an enduring bipartisan space to assess the capacity of Congress to perform its constitutional duties. And we also aim to collabor collaborate on ideas for improving the legislative branch's performance in our separation of powers system. While my co-director, Lee Drutman, and I each have ideas about how to make Congress great again, this group is not an exercise in us coming and pushing ideas on the Hill and saying, do this, do that. Rather, we aim to foster legislative entrepreneurs amongst congressional staff and members who will, pro who will propose reforms. We're also building a network of nonpartisan experts who can help congressional reformers and be available to congressional staff. Usually, we do not have media at our meetings, but we decided to open this one up, just an FYI, because we're hoping to raise the awareness of this group's efforts. It is a time of transition in government, so the time seemed ripe to do this. Uh, a new president's coming, a new Congress arrives in January, and it seems uh, that many voters have sent a message that they want change and they're dissatisfied. So perhaps all the more reason for us to talk about legislative branch reorganization and reform. And so that's today's general topic, legislative reform past and present. So I'll just tee things up quickly and then I'll turn it over to our two speakers. Um, as history shows, our Congress is, as Congressional Research Service put it in an excellent volume, it's an evolving Congress. It regularly alters its organization and operations, usually in small ways that are scarcely perceptible to anyone off the hill. However, we do see periods when the legislative branch enacts massive change. In 1946, the Legislative Reorganization Act was passed by the Democratic-controlled Congress. It made many changes to the organization and operations to Congress. It reduced the number of standing committees. It redrew committee jurisdictions. Certainly not an easy thing to do. It created a new budget process, increased committee staff, and authorized the Legislative Reference Service, which became CRS, to hire senior specialists, policy experts, to help Congress out. The 46 legislation also included lobbying reform and various small bore changes like upgrades to the Senate cafeteria. Uh, this was a soup to nuts reform, and it was driven by a variety of factors. Uh, not least was the expansion of the executive branch over the preceding decades during the Great Depression and during World War II. And there was, with that, a concurrent diminishment of Congress in the policymaking process and arguably in the public esteem. Rising executive, diminishing Congress, boom, time for reform. So that's what they did. Uh, they tried to reestablish a bit of balance between the branches by strengthening Congress. And interestingly, President Harry Truman welcomed the reforms, and he signed the law without delay. In his signing statement, he declared, <clears throat> both as United States Senator and as President, I've had occasion to observe some of the outmoded organizational and procedural traditions that have burdened the legislative branch. The present act should permit easier and closer relations between the executive agencies of the government and the Congress. The expanded staff of the congressional committees and of the agencies in the legislative branch can become a valuable link between the policymaking deliberations of the Congress and the practical administrative experience of the executive branch. So he did not see it as a threat, but he cast it as a positive development. The story of congressional form obviously does not and should not end there. And to help us today uh, think about the topic, we have Walter Olashek and Mark Strand. Walter is going to talk about the 1970s reform, and Mark will tell you about a current legislative branch reform bill. <clears throat> 
Now, just a brief bio on, on Walter and one on Mark. Walter is a senior specialist at CRS. If anyone knows more about Congress than Walter, I don't know who that person is. He's been at CRS for, <laughs> dare I say, almost 50 years, yeah. uh, and is the author of way too many studies to enumerate. Uh, but his congressional procedures and the policy process needs to be mentioned because it's a classic, and so too do his books Congress Against Itself and Congress Under Fire, because both of those give insider analyses of efforts at congressional reform. Walter worked on the 1970 Legislative Reform Act, and if you visit his office in the Madison Building, maybe he'll show you his presidential signing pen. Mm -hmm. uh, he also was a policy director of Congress's 1993 Joint Reorganization Committee, a topic we might want to ask about in our Q&A, because those reform efforts, substantial as they were, did not produce the sort of watershed legislation that we saw in the 70s and in the 1940s. Mark Strand has been president of the not-for-profit Congressional Institute since 2007. His organization sponsors major conferences and other events where men, members of the Congress can socialize, discuss policy issues, and his organization also engages in outreach to educate citizens on how Congress operates. Mark spent more than two, two decades on the Hill and has served as a committee staff director and held top positions in the office of Bill Lowry of California and Stan Parrish of Virginia. He's also the author of the book, Surviving Inside Congress, and his blog, The Sausage Factory, is a fun read for anyone interested in the machinery and machinations of Congress. And so with that, I will turn it over to Walter. Okay, Kevin, uh, thanks very much uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, he read it as I wrote it, but anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, I liked it. I don't know if my wife liked it, but anyway, um, and then as a CRS employee, I want to underscore that uh, I'm, I'm speaking for myself, I'm not for CRS, so let me, let me highlight that point of view. And what I hope to say is objective, but, you know, at least from my point of view. But anyway, um, I want to do two things fundamentally. One is I want to make first a couple observations about congressional reform, and then I want to talk about the 70 Reorganization Act, and uh, we'll see how much time I consume. And, and uh, I might turn it over to Mark or do a little mini filibuster. Who knows, all right? But anyway. Reform the filibuster. <laughs> yeah, we can reform that. Um, I guess the, the first point I would make about uh, uh, my reform observation would be that thank you all for coming. Thank you for the participants here. And I say that for this specific reason, that in terms of getting reform actions enacted, you've got to develop sort of an inside and outside kind of a coalition. You've got to promote a co constituency for change inside the Congress and outside the Congress to overcome, really, a constituency for the status quo that often exists. Change is tough for a lot of members, without question. And it's great that all of you folks are here because it demonstrates that there's keen interest, at least we hope, in terms of improving the organization and operation of the United States House and the United States Senate. So that's observation number one. Observation number two is that congressional reform is not for the faint-hearted. It's often a multi-year process. There's a lot of conflict, controversy. You know, it's very hard to do. It's tough business. And I'll give you a concrete example from one of my other experiences working on legislative reform. And this happened to be the 73-74 House Select Committee on Committees, chaired by a guy that maybe some of you might know, Dick Bowling, Richard Bowling, who was acknowledged to be one of the premier scholars and members of the 20th century. Um, and he proposed, along with the other nine members, it was a bipartisan committee, two years in existence. And one of the big things that it did was to dramatically change the committee system, not only rejiggering jurisdictional lines among the standing committees, but creating new ones. For example, one of the creations was potential creations because the whole thing flopped in the end in terms of this particular restructuring. Let's create an energy and environment committee. On the theory, you put these two big topics together and let them fight it out within the committee and maybe bring a consensus product to the floor for the consideration of all members. Well, obviously this upsets a lot of lawmakers because you have to change things. You have to take away and give. And one of the things about parliamentary changes is you got to figure out who's got the power and the reformers typically want, we want the power to a degree. And so 
in this example that I want to just give you, Mr. Dingle, John Dingle, the longest serving member ever in the history of the United States Congress, was, was very upset. You know, we could call him angry. We could call him mad. We could call him livid in terms of his opposition to what Bowling and Martin, the minority leader of the committee, were trying to do because he lost a lot of his power because his committees and subcommittees were wiped out. <clears throat> so, Bowling is a smart guy, no doubt about it. So he, he might send one of the most articulate reformers and knowledgeable people, maybe sit down with me, Mr. Dingo, privately. A guy like Paul Sarbanes, if you remember Paul Sarbanes, a Democrat from Maryland, Rhodes Scholar. All right, ship him off to sit down with Mr. Dingle. And he might make these high road arguments that are always made in terms of reform. And that is, if we demonstrate to the American public that we can put our house in order, then maybe our public standing will rise, and that's all to the good for a representative body. But also, all reformers typically will say, when you deal with the committee system, what we want is to promote comprehensive, coordinated, systematic policymaking. And everybody nods, that's exactly what we want. Well, after you make those kinds of arguments, it won't probably take a, uh, one of the member like, member like Dingle to, to tell Paul Sarbanes the, in this make-believe example, <laughs> go, commit a, go commit a biological improbability. All right, uh, it is not going to work. It's just not going to work that way. Well, anyway, on, on to the 1970s. The 1970s was a period of tremendous change, tremendous change, some of it driven by prods and challenges from the White House, like the War Powers Resolution of 1973 or the Congressional Budget and Empowerment Control Act of 1974. 1975, a big year in the Senate because that's when we got the current 60 vote requirement for filibuster. You had lots of other changes. Transparency was big uh, in that area. Electronic voting, which came out of a recommendation of the 70 Act, instituted in 1973. You had cable televising of floor procedures in the House starting in 1979. Conference committees, which heretofore and still are, by the way, Closed, secret sessions. Nonetheless, you had rules adopted in the House and the Senate in 75 and 77 to at least have a presumption that there will be public conference meetings, not to say that negotiations don't take place in secret. You had the empowerment of a lot of junior members. You had committee reform not only in the House, you had committee reform over in the Senate under the so-called Stevenson Committee in 1976-1977. So you had lots and lots of reform. And one of those was the 70 Reorganization Act, which I'll talk about specifically now. On the 1946 Act, just a reference there. First time in Congress's history that you had a collaborative effort between the House and the Senate to pass a comprehensive restructuring of the legislative branch also done by an omnibus legislative branch re reorganization bill, both never done before in the history of the Congress. So the 1965 reformers, and you've got to remember, 64 was a big election year, and so you had a large influx of new lawmakers, anxious and breathing fire to shake up the place in a lot of, a lot of respects and dimensions. And so um, 1965, uh, you had this 12-person rules committee, joint committee, I should say, created, uh, three, 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 and three, bipartisan, bipartisan, chaired by now a senator, uh, Senator Mike Monroney of Oklahoma, and the ranking Democrat, the co-chair, was a man by the name of Ray Madden, a Democrat from Indiana, so it was, again, bipartisan thing. And Monroney, I'll, I'll specially, you know, spe say something about him specially because he also was co-chair of the 1945 Joint Committee in terms of Bob LaFollette mm -hmm. and Mike Monroney. And now he's in the United States Senate, and he's now the chair, really the premier guy on the 65 Joint Committee. So what can be said about it? Well, I say a bunch of things about it. What happened was uh, 
Well, let me give you the context briefly in terms of um, what happened. Um, the committee reported out a, a big bill in January, or excuse me, um, um, July of 19, uh, well, I gotta get the dates right, it's, it's, I think 20, but it's 1966, you know, <laughs> sort of my era. But anyway, um, but nothing happened. Uh, time had run out, and so the next Congress, the 91st, you had the Senate actually take the lead because, you know, that's where Monroney was. And so you had um, roughly three months, January, February, March, where this was the top priority, the Legislative Reorganization Act of 1967, passed by a large margin, 75 to 9, and then went over to the, to the House. And the House was like the Bermuda Triangle of legislative reform. All right, things went in there mm -hmm. and shipped to the Rules Committee, and, uh, well, in this case, never to be heard of very much at all. Now, there was efforts made, bipartisan efforts made. This is a bipartisan effort. You had Democrats and Republicans joined together to try to convince Speaker John McCormick to tell the Rules Committee to send the bill to the floor. Well, it never happened. It never, never happened. You had a demonstration on the floor in October of 60, when was it, 68? Man by the name, you'll know the name, Don Rumsfeld was a member of the House, a Republican, and led Rumsfeld's Raiders. He teamed up with a Democrat from California, a guy by the name of Tom Reese, and they managed to hold the House in session for about 32 straight hours to demonstrate and pressure, you know, McCormick to bring it to the floor before the Congress ended. Well, it never worked, but nonetheless, they're picking up ahead of steam. And so finally, in the next Congress, you had you know, new members coming in, and a driver of change in any institution that you belong to is the influx of new blood into that institution to bring, and they typically want to make changes that will allow them to participate more broadly in the policy process. And so you had the Democratic Study Group, which was around since the mid-50s, but they played a large role you had from freshmen create a Tuesday group. You had the Rumsfeld group. You had a task force on congressional reform by Republicans. They proposed, they write a book, edited volume of, written by numerous Republican lawmakers called We Propose a Modern Congress. So you have this kind of welling up. There's something called the American Assembly. I had to look it up this morning. What the hell is it? But anyway, I mean, I have books, but it's a, it's a nonpartisan group run out of Columbia University. Uh, I think when even Eisenhower, you know, well, was, well, well that's when Eisenhower was around. But anyway, uh, um, they held a, a national meeting trying to highlight, you know, the importance of legislative reorganization. They held regional meetings, so you had this kind of contextual factor. You also had insiders, insiders. And I'll again mention Bowling because he wrote a well-known book called House Out of Order, which reflected his sentiments. He did not like this uh, committee suzerainty that dominated the place, an oligarchy. He liked the idea of party government and wanted to strengthen the Democratic caucus. Remember, this is a Democratic era in the House. Um, and, you know, was, was successful in the end on that effort. And, and in the Senate, you had a Senator Joe Clark of Pennsylvania write a book called Congress, the Sapless Branch, you know, which highlighted the sentiment of a lot of people in that institution as well. So you had this kind of momentum to a degree being created. And so the sense was, by golly, we need to build on the 1946 Act because in many respects it's uh, obsolete in some places. It needs to be, you know, improved. You know, some deficiencies need to be changed, whatever. And all right, so now we have the second time in Congress's history where they create this joint committee. <clears throat> so what was the end product? Well, these are the, the big ticket items I would suggest that the 70 reorganization dealt with. It was a modest effort, but a successful effort uh, at change because Monroney, Madden, they wanted to make sure that they consulted all the bases and, you know, built up change proposals that would actually pass the House and the Senate. Nothing dramatic in terms of trying to address filibuster, trying to address seniority, any of these hot topics. They wanted consensus as best they could, 
on all of these different topics that I'll mention. One of those themes, I'll just mention two or three. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the themes was to curb the power of the committee chairs. This was this still the era of committee government. I, when, when Kevin mentioned almost 50, it's you know, working on 49. But I came 69, still the era of committee government, where the place was run in the House and the Senate by the dukes and the barons and the autocrats at Capitol Hill. And they were the powerful seniority leaders of the committees in both chambers. And they're not very sympathetic you know, to reform, at least the kinds of reforms that would address seniority or other topics of that sort. <clears throat> but nonetheless, you had some modest changes. Let's have written committee rules require that so that all members of a committee would know what their rights and responsibilities are. All right, let's, <clears throat> let's allow committees, a majority on a committee, to call special meetings if the chair is reluctant to call meetings. <clears throat> so you had you know, some of these kinds of changes. Small bore, small bore, but, but, but the beginning of trying to curb the autocratic authority of these committee barons. Probably the, one of the biggest developments in terms of the 70 Act, maybe the most important one some suggest, is in the area of transparency. Transparency, anti-secrecy. There are a bunch of proposals, but the one that really captured the imagination of many out in the public uh, was the idea that we're going to have recorded teller votes in the Committee of the Whole. As many of you might know who serve in the House, the Committee of the Whole is often the forum where a lot of amendments are made. Now, pre-70 Act, when people voted, there was no record of how they voted. People would walk up, you know, tell, you know, I'm for or against the proposition, meaning the amendment. And then you have the total, basically, 150 to 120, we'll say. You don't know who voted which way. And that was, of course, exactly the thrust of uh, the reform proposal, because this was also the time when there's a lot of ferment in society, particularly anti-Vietnam War sentiment. So you had outside groups who were engaged in trying to change this particular procedure, because they didn't know who to try to put pressure on to try to you know, vote the proper way from their lights, all right, to defund, we'll say, some of the war, some of the war effort. <clears throat> and I mentioned the DSG. One of the most prominent staff people <clears throat> since my time, in terms of his impact with us, was a guy named Dick Conlon, the head of the Democratic Study Group. He had a tragic accident. He was a boater on Chesapeake Bay. The boom came along and banged him in the head, and he drowned. But anyway, that's a sad, sad tale. But a journalist, and that's important because he said, you know, one of the things that will rile up newspaper editors around the country is to raise this issue about ending secrecy in the House of Representatives. And by golly, he wrote all these edit you know, editorial letters and sent them out to hundreds of newspapers. Now, what the outside groups did, because they wanted to get the names of the people, if they could, they trained staff, like, like many of us in this room, to sit in the galleries, they, they trained them in terms of looking at the physique of different members. Maybe you catch a glimpse of their face because they're going to march you up this aisle and their backs are going to be to you, you know, when you're sitting up in the gallery. So they would record, yeah, yay or nay, on these members. And so what happened was, maybe deliberately, maybe accidentally, they recorded members in error. Yet all of this information was transmitted to the newspapers of the members and their constituents. And a lot of them got, oh, my God, this is awful. If they're going to do this, we might as well have it done right. <laughs> right? Have it done right. So let's allow, let's vote for it. And, you know, Conlon and others, I mean, in terms of bipartisan, they got a conservative Republican, well-respected, a guy named Charles Gubser. And then for the Democrat, they prevailed on Tip O'Neill, you know, the Democrat from Massachusetts, to, to sponsor this recorded teller vote amendment, and it went through. And then just one other I, I, I highlighted in the terms of <clears throat> transparency and anti-secrecy. There was a parliamentarian, and you probably have all dealt with the parliamentarians. Well, when I came, the most formidable staff person 
in the House, it seemed to me, was Lou Deschler, mm -hmm. Lou Deschler, the parliamentarian. When I worked on this special subcommittee of the Rules Committee, crafting the Legislative Reorganization Act, the members always had to say about a change, let's go down and we gotta check it out with Lou. We gotta check it out with Lou. I said, oh my God, this guy, and I was told later, he never talks to staff, members only. The members come to him. They don't go to, he doesn't go to them. Because he, the speakers of the House relied on him and the precedents were only up to date to 1936. The rest, and he came in 1928. So he had all this knowledge about precedents that were never published any place except by him in his office. So members, you know, they would go down because he, he knew the rules and precedents. They could find a precedent to say yay or nay to almost anything. And so you had some, you know, junior, junior Republicans, uh, particularly. I mean, you don't know, remember Bill Steiger at all. No reason you should. We're in Wisconsin, a tremendously nice guy and a competent lawmaker, and he had allies. And, and they put in the Reorganization Act, publish an update of the parliamentary precedents. Took a while, but none of us, it happened. And maybe uh, the last, last theme was some, some measure of minority rights, some degree of let's, you know, help out the, the minority. And of course, this time, you know, in 40 straight years, the Republicans were in the minority. And so they had, again, modest things, conference reports. All right, well, we're going to, half the time for debate under the hour rule is going to go to the, go to the re Republicans in this case. The motion to recommit, never subject to any debate, five minutes, five minutes each side. All right, so what we call really major things. They did have elimination of general proxies, not specific proxies, because, you know, if this was a committee room, and I'm the chair, the Democratic chair, and you're all Republicans, you think you're gonna outvote me. No, you're not, because I take out of my pocket 50 proxies, and I overwhelm all of you sitting here. And of course, that was quite annoying <laughs> <laughs> to, the minority, to the minority party. Uh, so those were, those were some, of the, some of the things. And maybe I'll just end, I brought, I happened to run, a, of course I was searching for something to end with, and I came up, came up with this one. And this is, uh, this is a, a, I think, a useful, a useful thing. And that is uh, a statement by Minority Leader Jerry Ford. Probably 1973 when he went before the Select Committee on Committees. And this is what he had to say. Quote, reform is a tricky word. Change, per se, is not necessarily the same as progress. Each and every proposal for reform of Congress must be weighed against other suggested reforms, and all must be weighed in the balance of power between the branches of government. So reform, it's a loaded word, means change for the better. Whether or not it's deform, however, often in the eyes of the who are affected adversely. Thank you. All right, right. Mark. Great. It's always great to be with Walter Olazek because uh, one of the things, I had some experience in the House and the Senate, as with Senator Talent, this is the 10th anniversary of my involuntarily resignation from the Senate. Thanks for the voters. Uh, uh, but I also teach at George Washington University. And if you take my course, you would get two Walter Olazek books. Uh, You're a good read. man. Yes. Because <laughs> he is such a great expert on it, and so a tremendous resource. And I also want to thank Kevin and Lee for your work you know, being in the private sector and advocating for Congress. We have a wide moat. Not a lot of people in this country are <laughs> pro-advocates right now. And uh, But the idea of making Congress work better is essential to our form of government. Uh, you know, it's, we have a, a government that uh, gets its legitimacy from the consent of the governed through its representatives. And if, uh, if everyone's out there saying Congress is a failed institution or Congress doesn't work anymore, it's undermined the question of whether or not the people are capable of self-rule. And so reform is important in a lot of ways, just only to maintain our, our constitution and our system of government. I mean, it just it has to be done. Uh, you, our involvement in this got started with a, a thing called the Breakfast Group. It was headed by Mike Johnson, who used to be Bob Michaels' chief of staff, and had Bob Walker, a former member of Congress from Pennsylvania, who knew the rules inside and out, uh, Bob Livingston, a former chairman, and a bunch of other key people. And it, it got started because a few freshman members said, well, you know, we're not legislating. How, you know, how does this place work? And it suddenly came to everyone's conclusion that right now, 
it, it, actually, it's, I haven't updated the numbers yet, but only 10 percent of the Senate and 10 percent of the House were present the last time the budget worked on time and on schedule. That means 90 percent of the people working here have never seen it done right in terms of the 1974 Act and the schedule and things like that. So it was obviously a big issue, and they, we start out with small groups talking about how to legislate. Uh, but we've become such a leadership-driven process here that the, the pendulum swung so far from the committee side to the leadership side that uh, you know, members, of, I think, frequently feel more like they're voters and observers. Uh, they're not decision makers and not legislators. And so uh, there's been a big need. And this is back that we did a uh, survey and reform last year uh, where, you know, one out of every, uh, only one, you know, four out of every five Americans feel that their voice is not heard in Washington. We kind of saw evidence of that last Tuesday, about some of that feeling. Uh, the vast majority think the uh, Congress is not accountable to them, except accountable to people inside Washington themselves. And so they've lost confidence in the institution, uh, which is another reason why reform is more necessary than ever. Um, and I think one of the great models uh, of doing this is the, um, is the whole ref committee reform process. Uh, Almost every 20 years, Congress has to go through an exercise of purging itself from sort of built up precedents and bad ways of doing things and bad habits and, and come up with some solutions. And some have been more successful than others. The, the 1940s one is sort of like the granddaddy of them all. Uh, the 1970s one is highly successful in changing the institution. Uh, and even the 90s, right? They, they, they didn't do a lot, but the, Gingrich included a few of the things when he became speaker. Um, so, but it's time. I mean, it's time again, we're, another 20-year period for Congress to take this job on. Uh, to a large degree, that's also why there's now been uh, legislation introduced in the House. Um, it's uh, introduced by Darren LaHood and uh, Dan Lipinski, bipartisan, has uh, 37 other co-sponsors, 11 Democrats and 28 Republicans. Uh, it's H. Conrez 169, for any of you who want to look it up. It's a concurrent resolution. Obviously, you don't need the president's signature to do a joint reform committee. Uh, it's a, a, a job for just the House and the Senate. And the whole purpose of that legislation is to create a very similar committee where you'd have six people from the House and six people from the Senate split evenly between the two parties. Uh, and they would make, hold a committee uh, and make recommendations after holding hearings and, and hearing different considerations and make recommendations about the kind of reforms Congress can enact. Uh, and if you look at it right now, there's a broad category of reforms that are needed. Uh, the budget. Anyone, who thinks of, anyone here thinks the budget process works the way it should? Just checking. Might be a buzz, budget committee chair here. And even then, they, they don't think so. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't work. And we know it doesn't work. Uh, and it needs to be redone. But you can't just do that in a vacuum. You can't, the budget committee can't come up with a recommendation by itself because it affects everything. It affects authorizing committees. It affects appropriators. It affects ways and, me ways and means in finance. It affects the White House. This is the sort of thing that requires the entire Congress to consider on a bipartisan basis because the effects are so far-reaching and far-changing. But we know that has to be done. Uh, the authorization process has collapsed to a large degree. About a third of the discretionary budget is are bills that are appropriated that are not authorized, which is against the rules, by the way, of both the House and the Senate. We just happen to waive those rules whenever they become inconvenient or have unanimous consent request to ignore it. Uh, and as a result, you know, the, author the authorizers aren't getting to do their job. Now, that's how Congress holds the administration accountable, is through the authorization process. When, the con when, the, when John Dingell was chairman of Energy and Commerce, the worst thing in the world for a bureaucrat was to get what they called a Dingle grant, which is a letter from John Dingell inviting you to come explain yourself to the Congress. And this was, you know, put the fear of death in most bureaucrats, and they realized that they were accountable to the people who were elected by the citizens for their actions. But when you take away the authorization process, and no, the administration doesn't have to worry about you passing an authorization bill, they can just ignore you. Because they don't, they get, they're just going to go to the Appropriations Committee, get some sort of omnibus bill where everything is stuffed in there, and Congress loses its ability to have a say in how things are being spent and what's going on. So it's very important to restore the authorization process. Uh, we've put out, uh, we're putting out some re reform ideas about how you do that, but the most important thing is you need a forum where both parties can get together and both chambers can get together and start the process of fixing the system. Whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you want the system to work. Uh, and since we've been at rough political parity now for 
really pretty much since like the 92 election between the two parties, uh, you know, both parties realize they may be in the majority one year and the minority the next. In fact, there's a Tuesday that the Senate, for instance, was very much in question. We had no idea. I mean, but that's a regular course of the way we do business nowadays. So it's in the interest of both parties to actually go about having a serious reform during this period of time. Uh, the other things that we were talking about, the, the rules of procedure, you know, the idea of granting waivers all the time so that things don't get done in the House. The Senate, the whole idea of the filibuster and cloture. You know, in the 70s, the Mondale reform, which reduced cloture to 60 votes, was thought to be a great idea. Here we can get cloture much easier. It actually had the opposite effect of creating the silent filibuster, where it just sort of became incumbent upon the majority to somehow come up with 60 votes to move any major legislation. Yeah, you know, was that the intent? Uh, I don't think that was the intent, but that's been the net effect of that. And the House has become, the Rules Committee is the Speaker's Committee. Every single member of the majority, a two to one plus one majority, is appointed by the Speaker. Uh, and so whether the House works really depends on the good graces of the Speaker. Uh, sometimes you have good speakers, you know, and I think, you know, Paul Ryan, I think, is a very good speaker, and I think he will, con I think as of tomorrow, he will continue to be, <laughs> uh, continue to be a speaker. But you know, uh, the whole idea is that why should it be subject to the goodwill of a person shouldn't be in the rules. Shouldn't they change the rules to reflect that? Uh, executive power, I think, is another thing that we've seen on and on. The, this, the rising use of executive agreements and executive orders taking on pseudo-legislative powers. That used to be the rules of the Congress. Uh, this is another area. So I've, I've been given the sign that we've got to get to questions. So um, the committee, the whole idea to set up a, a committee is a, bi a bipartisan, bicameral committee. It doesn't have original jurisdiction, so it's just making recommendations. Uh, the idea is to consider the laws, like the budget that had to be changed, rules of each chamber that need to be changed, and even party rules. It might include things like campaign finance laws might have to become involved. But the whole gamut can be discussed in a bipartisan context and get in, people in giving testimony talk about different ideas. On our website, we have started a, what we call the Congressional Reform Project. We have been a little provocative. Uh, Max has, has been holding me to the fire for some of the things. Uh, but in terms of like changing the rules of the House or changing the budget process, um, you know, uh, it's kind of, I put out provocative ideas to get people thinking about reform. But there are hundreds of different reforms that are possible, some of which are the most important thing in the world to somebody. The idea is to create a forum by which they can be heard and where Congress can come up with recommendations and if, I think, in this present atmosphere where the presidential election was so unsettling to the country because of this, this favor of the government, you know, make the 115th Congress a reform Congress. I mean, why not? Both parties have an interest in doing it. Uh, we all have an interest in making sure Congress continues, keeps its place in the constitutional order of power uh, as the people's representatives. And we're not going to, at the present rate we're going, we're not going to do it unless we come up with some significant reform. I'm very hopeful our Senate colleagues will be introducing a bill in the beginning of next Congress. Uh, the faster we get this joint resolution started, the faster we can convene the committee and get on with the real business of reforming the way Congress works. And can I just ask, who, who will be the senators? Do you, are you, I, are you I can, I'm not their press spokesman, so I okay. cannot say yet. All right. Okay. <laughs> sure, make some news here. Uh, all right. So now this is the, the question and answer uh, period that I will uh, moderate. So folks who have questions, please introduce yourself, tell us, tell us who you are. Uh, I'm particularly interested in, in sort of thinking about what are the reform prospects. I'll just ask one, take one moderator's privilege and ask a question. What, sorry, what, what are the reform prospects uh, in this cu current Congress, given the election that just happened? And, and particularly from the historical perspective, are, are there is it when you have unified government, do it make us the 46 reform happened under unified government, but that was. Yeah, I, I think, let, let me take one crack at it. I think that the atmosphere is good for reform only in the sense that the people clearly have spoken about Congress and they're not happy with the job Congress is doing. Now granted, Americans are never terribly fond of Congress. We, we're, we're naturally suspicious of anyone who voluntarily wants power over you. you know, we've done a survey um, when Paul, after Paul Ryan became speaker. You know what the number one reason why people liked him? He didn't want the job. <laughs> and, and that reluctant leadership, is, uh, George, we have George Washington to thank for that. You know? so, so people are normally you know, are highly suspicious of government, uh, people, voluntary government in general. So there's some of that. But, but you, we all sense it. It's gotten worse. People just don't believe the system works anymore. They don't believe it's responsive to them. Uh, and so I think the atmosphere still exists. The question is, can the majority recognize 
that giving the minority more rights is actually in their interest. For right. instance, okay. earmark reform. You know, we need to restore earmarks. Now, I, we can call them something different. I, I'm open to all different names, congressionally mandated projects, locally vital national emergency projects, whatever you want to call them. But the bottom line is earmarks are part of the grease that made the wheel turn. You know, because of a, a, a young Democrat member in the House who hasn't been in the majority, who has very little prospects of moving up to a committee power, can go home and say, you know what, you know, they included that wing, additional wing on the VA hospital. You know, so I don't have to be in the majority to get things done. And now instead of my only incentive being to blow up a system that I have no say in, I now have the opportunity to perhaps come home and report, hey, I'm in the majority, but I got things done. I'm representing you. And majority gets the benefit of probably getting that particular member's vote on that given appropriation bill. So they increase the size of majorities, the bipartisan majorities. They let members go home and take credit for the work they're doing so they don't have an interest to do nothing but obstruct. And all of a sudden, you, you're actually starting, the majority is helped by empowering the minority. Once they become convinced of that, I think that you know, people thought that maybe if you had a Democrat Senate in the House that was Republican, they, there'd be more incentive because it'd be kind of like on neutral ground. You'd have a Democrat Senate chairman, a Republican House chairman. Uh, it didn't happen that way. But I, I think the Republicans need to understand that they benefit by giving the Democrat minority more rights in the House. It's actually beneficial to them. If, they, if that argument wins, I think we can have like some success. Sell. Depends how many close votes you have. <laughs> how, it depends how big the Freedom Caucus is this year, too. So, so a big freedom caucus would be the key to, ironically, would be the key to success for reform? Well, you know, if, if we are going to do conditional party government, which is a political science term of having parties run everything, where, you, you know, that means Republicans have to get 218 votes within their own conference to win anything. If you have a too strong a group that was against you, you have to have the ability to release the pressure and go get some other people. Yeah. The minority doesn't necessarily have an interest in helping you. you know, the, the president's a Republican. I mean, it's the first midterms, by tradition, be a good Democrat. Yeah, why do they want to help the Republicans accomplish anything? So the Democrat leadership may have a different attitude, but I think if you're a rank-and-file Democrat member who has very little prospects of moving up because of the seniority system in the House, you have an interest in perhaps working with the majority to get some things done for your constituents. Well, uh, I hope the climate is there. I mean, that's my bias. Um, State it right at the outset. I mean, I, I just got to make two quick points, and that is number one, it's very helpful to get the leadership on both sides of the aisle, you know, and, and both chambers on board in order to get stuff like this done. And without it, it's going to be hard. And when you have a new president coming in with a, a, an agenda that still is, you know, being worked out, although some has been publicly articulated, that you know, what, it's, it's a question mark whether or not party leaders want to spend the time right at the outset of a brand new Congress focusing on something that divides the membership of their party and the other party. I mean, this is uh, highly controversial. It's a matter of who's got the power and who wants the power to a large degree. So I'm, I'm not sure on that one. I just throw, throw that out. On, on, on the joint committee concept, and Mark knows this well and others too, the Senate is averse at the moment to joint committees. I mean, that's been sort of the, the history at the moment. Uh, there was a 76, 77 effort by the Senate to eliminate all joint committees, <clears throat> including the four that we have today. Mm -hmm. But they stepped back and kept the four that we have today, but um, abolished you know, three or four others as well. Now, whether or not they're gonna go along with creating a joint committee at the start of the next Congress on, on this and expend capital doing that, you know, I just don't, it's, well, we'll have to wait and see what happens. 